Hey, uh, I do want to say as we get started tonight, if you want to go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, we'll be diving there in a minute. And uh, how many have enjoyed this series? Uh, this is, uh, again, I'm, I'm going I'm to explain a little bit. Sometimes as a pastor, you have a vision of where you believe God is taking a series and a, and a sermon uh, series that we're doing. And all the way through this, uh, God has absolutely changed this series and this series really turned into something that I didn't think it was going to be, but God took it in a, in a different direction. And uh, to all of those that are mad at me, it's not my fault. <laughs> I had a lady tell me that she was mad at me because uh, she was having to go get a pedicure because I stepped all over her toes. <laughs> I've had some other people tell me, but I'm going to tell you, as I preach these messages to you, sometimes they may come off kind of hard uh, and loving, but... Nobody gets their toes stepped on any more than your pastor does because when I study and God takes me in a new direction, it is amazing what he deals with in my life and, and I'm just thankful for God. I'm thankful that he speaks to us through his word and how incredible he is. Um, I do want to say last night, uh, anyone that went to the WT pool for our end of school or our, the school bash, our end of the summer nights, that was a fun night, wasn't it? I think we had about 75 people end up at the pool at WT, and it was a blast. I think we loved it so much, we may just uh, want to do that for Christmas and have a Christmas party out there. Yeah? Yeah? So, happy birthday, Raymond! Uh, don't get so excited, okay? Raymond informed us he was 47 years old. Amen. Then you can come to the altar and repent here in a minute. <laughs> Just kidding, Raymond. Just kidding. Hey, uh, I'm going to do something a little different, and I haven't even talked to my staff about this. So this is our staff meeting, okay? And so I'm having a staff meeting right now. I'm going to inform my board and everybody of this. Uh, this Wednesday night, I am ending my series that I've been doing in here on Hashtag Jesus, looking at the life and the miracles of Jesus, but really looking below those miracles of how they impact our lives today. And I'm going to be ending this series. There is a testimony that Joyce Myers gives, and it is a testimony that I believe could change your life. It is, she is very real and uh, kind of raw in this testimony, and it is so awesome. But we're going to be showing this video uh, Wednesday night to close out this series. And, uh, but this is what I'm going to throw in uh, in the mix. We always do, in, in pastor's class, we always do the first Wednesday a uh, potluck uh, dinner. And I'm going to invite our entire church out for Wednesday night. We're going to go out into the new building. I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy probably 75 to 100 pieces of chicken. So I will provide the meat. But I believe this is a video that you will need to see, that you would love to see. And I think it is a perfect close to our, to our Hashtag Jesus series that we're doing. And so I'm inviting you guys to come out. It is our Pot Luck Wednesday. I will be providing the meat, and I'm buying a lot of meat. So that means I'm expecting every one of you guys to show up. We are wanting to feed all of our youth. We're wanting to feed everyone, all of our kids. And so get here a little bit early, uh, maybe around 630. We will just start. You know how we are. We, we see food and church that eats together grows together. And so, uh, so uh, but anyway, uh, we're going we're gonna to be here. But I'm trusting you to bring the side dishes and everything. Uh, are you all excited about that? Yeah, so I think it's going to be an awesome night. We're praying that God will use this video to just transform you, kind of unlock some things in your mind, and we're just praying God for miracles. Amen? We're in this series called Identity Theft, and uh, as we dove into this, uh, I just knew it would be a series that God was going to set some people free of some things that have helped us back. So as we dive in, let me take you to Ephesians, and then we'll, we'll kind of warm up and get into everything. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 11, it says this, Put on all of the armor that God supplies. In this way, you can take a stand against the devil's strategies. This is not a wrestling match against a, home, a human opponent. We are wrestling with rulers authorities, the powers who govern this world of darkness, and spiritual forces that control evil in the heavenly realm. For this reason, take up all of the armor that God supplies. Then you will be able to take a stand during these evil days. 
And once you have overcome all obstacles, you will be able to stand your ground. So then, take a stand. Fasten truth around your waist like a belt. Put on God's approval as your breastplate. Put on the shoes so that you are ready to spread the good news that gives peace. In addition to all these, take the Christian faith as your shield. With it, you can put out all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Also take salvation as your helmet and God's word as the sword that the Spirit supplies Pray in the Spirit in every situation. Use every kind of prayer and request there is. For the same reason, be alert. Use every kind of effort and make every kind of request for all of God's people. As we dove into this week one, we looked at being pickpocketed by the past. And we looked at, we dove in and we looked at the life of David. King David, the Word of God says, he was a man after God's own heart. But because David found himself in a place he was not supposed to be, David was supposed to be in battle with his men. We don't know why he was in Jerusalem. We do not know why he stayed behind. All we know is that the Word of God tells us that David was not where he was supposed to be. Now, how often do we find ourselves not where we're supposed to be? Whether it's in the internet, whether it's in a conversation or relationship with someone, there are times we find ourselves in a place where we're not supposed to be. And the Word of God goes on to describe David, a man after God's own heart, fell into a temptation, fell into a sin. And as we read the Word of God, we see this man of God go from a man after God's own heart to being described what I called a monster. He was a liar, a cheat, he stole someone else's wife, and he committed murder. But I love the rest of the story. The rest of the story is God never leaves us where we are. God's always there. He always sends someone to minister to us. He sends someone to help us through, to lend us the hand, to lift us up. But God never leaves us alone. And because Nathan came and ministered to David, David's life was restored. And as we read into Psalms, we hear the rest of the story of how David lived out a life for God. Isn't that the greatest story in the world? But we're not defined by our past. Week two, we looked at being hijacked by a lie. And as we were looking at being hijacked by a lie, there were three things that we discovered that we have to know if we're going to fight an enemy. It's not if we're going to fight an enemy. It's when we fight the enemy. Because what does the enemy do? The enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. So if we're going to fight the enemy and we're going to go into this battle and come out victorious, the first thing that we have to know is we have to know our enemy. We looked at the father of lies, that everything that comes out of his mouth is his native language and everything that he whispers into our ear is an absolute lie. So, so we looked at this, but not only do we have to know our enemy, we have to know our king. We have to know our authority in the name of Jesus. But not only that, we have to know our weapons. Now today we looked at that and today we're going to be talking about the fraud protection. I kind of wanted to call it naked and afraid, but uh, you'll see why here in a minute. But it's fraud protection because there is an enemy that comes at us with a fraud and he wants to speak lies into our ears. So we've got to know our weapons, but not only that, we need to know how to put them on, how to wear them, and how to do battle with these weapons. And we'll look at that here in just a moment. Last week we started the fraud protection and we really talked about how we fight this unseen battle. Because there is an enemy that is relentless in his attack against us. And his, his only option, or his only, only thing that he wants to do is to come at us to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I love the rest of John 10.10. 10. But God steps into the scene and says, Ah, my son Jesus, he's came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. So we've got to understand, and whenever we become a child of God, we enlist in the battle. We enlist. People say all the time, well, I didn't know living a Christian life was going to be so hard. Well, yeah, because when you, when you weren't a Christian, there wasn't a fight for your life. But now that you've become a Christian, you've enlisted and the fight is on and the battle is on. So today we're going to continue and we're going to, we're going to end this. 
And we're going to talk about the fraud protection. We're going to talk about don't fight naked and how to use the tools and how to use the resources that God gives us that we don't just go through life surviving. That's not what this thing is all about. This thing is about thriving in the name of Jesus, being somebody in the name of Jesus, standing up and taking hold of that very thing that God has birthed in you from the very beginning of your life. And there is no enemy that can defeat you when you are walking in the Word, when you are covered by the blood, and when you have your armor on. You may get wounded. You may get knocked in the head. You may get beat up a little bit. But the Word of God says you are victorious. And you, are, you have been made more than a conqueror in the name of Jesus. How cool is that? So real quick, let's look at the weapons. And I'm going to throw these up on the screen real quick. But let's look at the weapons that God gives us. And the, and the weapons that he gives us are things that we are to put on daily. Matter of fact, I don't think you're supposed to put them on daily. I don't think you're supposed to take them off when you go to bed. I think you're supposed to sleep in these things. But it's the belt of truth, the breastplate, and again, that's spelt wrong. I'm so sorry. The breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the gospel, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, and praying in the spirit. And we will come back to this here in just a moment. He was 18 years old. He didn't live in a good home. Mom and dad were split up. His dad was an alcoholic and a drug user. This young man at the age of 18, society looked at him as a waste because all he did was get in trouble with everything that he did. And just 24 hours prior to an incident that took place in his life, his dad, who was a druggie and an alcoholic, looked at this 18-year-old boy and he had just given his heart to the Lord, and this kid wanted nothing to do with God. He wanted nothing to do with church, and he didn't want nothing to do with his daddy telling him what to do in his life. He had been adopted by, uh, by a guy that was literally raising him very well-to-do in the Arlington area. Uh, he was a, kind of an up-and-up type of a family member. But, but this young man, Mari Davis, lived a very tough life. After his dad had told him that, he didn't know that 24 hours, and his dad told him this, God is going to use something to get your attention. Mari got up, walked out of the house, and 24 hours later, Mari is sitting in prison. He's got handcuffs on, and he's waiting for trial. Mari Davis was a drug user, and there was many things that he did in his life to just get enough money to buy enough things to have his next fix. And one night, Mari broke into a lady's house. She was not supposed to be home. He was high. He was, he was not very aware of what he was doing. But as, as he was robbing this lady, this widow lady comes around the corner and catches him. And Mari, not knowing what he was doing, kills her. He is so obliterated in his mind that he says, the only thing I remember of that night is her blood on my boots. Mari is now sitting in prison, and the uh, prosecuting attorney, attorney walks in and says, because of this heinous crime that you have committed, I am going for the maximum penalty, and I am going for the chair for your life, and you will be executed because of what you did. Mari went to prison, and his life was over with. His trial came, and I think he ended up with 65 years and was also looking at the, at the, death, uh, the death penalty. Mari Davis was in prison, and he's a little kind of Italian guy that was very scrappy and, and uh, many, many, many fights. And, and as he got into prison, he knew that he had to get with the right group of people because if he didn't get with the right group of people, that he would be obliterated. And so he ended up with the worst of the worst in prison. But while he was in prison, there was a guy that began to pour into his life. And he told Mari, he said, I've just accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And we've got a church service that takes place every Sunday down here. And I'd like to invite you to come. Mari doesn't know why he came. There was just a hopeless situation that he was going through. Guess what happened? Mari got what everybody called was jailhouse religion. Mari got in and got saved. And uh, 
But what Mari experienced was something that absolutely began to transform his life. Even though he had 65 years and was looking at the death penalty, Mari began to look at things and he began to see hope in the name of Jesus. He began to see hope in, 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 in his life. And he just began to pray. But on the other side of this, the lady that he murdered was a good Christian lady. And the lady in her, the lady that was in the prayer group with a bunch of other ladies, instead of hating Mari, who killed their, one of their best friends and one of their prayer warriors, they began to pray for Mari's life. Wow, is that not incredible? That's the kind of church I want. And they begin to pray for Mari. Mari finds Jesus in the prison. And Mari doesn't know any, he knows nothing. He's beginning to read the Bible. And he's taking it for Batum. And he begins to invite the worst of the worst to prison. And as they're in prison down to the church service. And they're all telling him, sissies, pansies, and snitches go to church. And as Mari would pass each and every one of them, He'd take his Bible and thump them on the chest as he's going down the road and just thump every one of them, tell them, I'll see you later. I'm going to church. After a while of this, they called Mari in, and Mari goes, well, I don't have to be sentenced to death because they're going to kill me right here. And they called him in, and they said, Mari, we don't know what it is about you, but whatever it is that you've got is real, and you can go to church anytime that you want. Mari began to go to church there in prison, and the Word of God says that we should compel them to come in. Amen. So Mari would invite all the prisoners to come, and if they didn't come, he'd just beat the hound out of them and drag them to church. <laughs> Mari had his nose broke more times than you could shake a stick at. Mari got in more fights, but he was compelling people to come. But all Mari knew was that God was doing something cool in his life, and he just wanted, some, he just wanted to see God do something in other people's life. Mari, for no reason except God is a God of grace. Mari goes before the board in time. He ends up only serving eight years in prison and time and time again for no reason as he would go in they would cut his sentence, cut his sentence, get him off of, of, of uh, get him out of the lecture chair. They would, they would do everything and towards the end of it he goes in and unexpectedly Mari only ends up serving eight years of a life sentence for him. A lot of people said that what Mari got was jailhouse religion that would never last. But Mari got on the other side of the gates, and I wanted to show you a picture. This is, this is what Mari does today. Mari was in prison for life, and now he pastors the largest Assembly of God church in Tennessee. Is that a testimony of who, how incredible our God is? God got him off of life because God had life in him. God had a plan and God had a purpose and God had a reason for his life. But Mari now pastors the largest church in Nashville, Tennessee, the largest assembly of God church in, in, uh, in Tennessee. And you look at this story and his story is a story of grace. It is a story of redemption and it is a story of hope. But this is Mari now. I think I've got a picture of him right now. This is Mari, uh, Mari Davis, and this, these are his, his wife next to him, Gail, and these are his three kids. He, had, he, had, he prayed for a family, boom, triplets. <laughs> Be careful how you pray. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> Amen? But Mari Davis, uh, Mari Davis is an absolute testimony of God's goodness, God's mercy, and God's grace. And as Mari Davis left prison and got on the outside of the prison he saw something in prison that opened his eyes to the reality of the spirit world that is around him and Mari said one day as I was in the showers with a bunch of naked men he said it was amazing that a fight broke out in that shower and he says if I'm standing watching this fight break out with naked men he said it got more involved, more involved, more ugly, more involved. And he sat and I looked at it and thought, that is absolutely the most comical thing I've ever seen <laughs> is naked people fighting in a shower. He said there's no protection. He said it is really ugly and it is comical. 
But as he said, as I watched this fight take place, it was like the Holy Spirit spoke into his life. But this is what Christians do every day of their life is they walk out into the world and they try to fight an enemy naked and stripped of any of the tools, any of the army, our armor, and any of the resources that God gives them to be victorious. Mari started a, uh, a uh, ministry, and I remember uh, when we first started dating, I bought a t-shirt for you that your daddy wasn't very happy about, but on the front of it, it said, don't fight naked. <laughs> well, after I became a uh, dad, I understood why he didn't like that shirt very well. But on the back of it, it said, put on the full armor of God. Today, what I want to talk to you about is the fraud protection that, the, that the, the Lord gives us against the fraud, the lie, and the schemes of the wicked one that comes into our life to kill, steal, and to destroy what God has placed in us from the very beginning. You see, what, what we have got to realize is that we are in the midst of a battle. We are in the midst of a war. We are in the midst of, of something that we cannot see with the physical eye. If God could walk in here today and strip the blinders away from our eyes and let us peer into the spirit world, it would probably scare us to death. Because what we've got to understand as the Word of God tries to line it out, the battle that we take place with, the battle that we're in the middle of, there are rulers, there are powers, there are authorities, there are spiritual forces that are in place working to destroy our lives. Now, just like Mari, how many of us have found ourselves in a situation trapped by our own wrongdoing? Or maybe we got trapped because of something that somebody else had done, but we find ourselves in some sort of a prison. A prison of an addiction, a prison that we can't stop lying, a prison that I have a bad attitude and I'm not going to give anybody a chance anymore and I'm locked into this thing. It may be a prison that I'm living in that I am just so angry. It is a prison of no hope. It is a prison that we find ourselves in. We've got to understand that in that prison, in that battle, and in that situation, we are in warfare. When you enlist, the enemy's coming at you. When you enlist into the armor of God, army of God, there is a battle that is real that is going to take place. God wants you to succeed. He gives us every resource we need to not just survive this thing, but to thrive in this life and be the people that God has created us to be. You got to know your enemy. Your enemy is a thief. He's the fraud of your life. He speaks evilness into your ear. And the enemy can only defeat us with the tools and the resources that we hand him. Because the Word of God tells me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I have people all the time say, Well, I didn't know that when I gave my life to Christ... <laughs> That it was going to be so hard. I didn't know that when I gave my life to Christ that there was going to be a battle that took place. I thought everything was going to be hunky-dory. I thought everything was going to be fine. Roads would be paved with gold and I'd go out in my backyard and pick dollar bills off a tree that was growing, that every need would be supplied. See, that's the lie of the enemy. That lie of the enemy would tell you, if God loves you, he'll just give you everything. God loves us enough not to spoil us rotten that way because none of us can handle that kind of spoiledness, you know? So we're in a battle. But what happens to so many people is this lie begins to be told into our ear over and over and over. And be honest with me, if you're anything like me, you believe the lie. Haven't we all? I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not handsome. I don't have enough hair. <laughs> you know, I can't do what everybody else does. And before long, we will begin to believe these lies. And instead, the Word of God says He is the lifter of our head. But instead, we're walking around in defeat with our head down. Because there's an enemy that we've got to understand. His only strategy only strategy, the Word of God says, is to kill. 
every hope, every dream, and every ambition that you have. To steal every desire of your heart and to kill you not only physically, but to kill you spiritually. See, hell was designed for who? Satan and his demons. But the Word of God says because there are many that will not follow, that will not listen, that will not go through that gate of salvation. The Word of God says that wide is that path that leads to destruction. A whole bunch of people are going to find that one, the Word of God says. Ronnie terminology is heap them, whole gob them. You know, a lot of people. But it also says that narrow is that path that leads to salvation. This is why we do what we do. We want you to understand our God. See, it's one thing to understand the enemy, but it's another thing to understand our God. It's another thing to walk in that understanding. Head knowledge and religion never saved anybody, but a relationship of the one who came to make change. When we have that relationship and we walk in that, it is amazing what begins to transpire, transpire in our life. Like I've said, you cannot get into the presence of God and not be changed. Moses, I love the story of Moses when he's up on the mountain. He comes down. He's in the presence of God. He comes down, and when he walks into the people, they look at him and basically go, ah! His face was shining with a glow because he had been in the presence of God that he had to put a veil over his face. You cannot get into the presence of God that he will not change you. But I have people all the time that they go through a situation, they go through a trial, they go through a trouble in their life and they make statements like this. But I pray and I don't get an answer. You ever been there? But I pray and I feel like God is not listening. Oh, but I pray, boom, boom. It felt like it just bounced right off the ceiling and bounced down to my lap. How about this one? But I prayed and I didn't get an answer in 36 seconds. So if I didn't get an answer in 36 seconds, I mean, Taco Villa can give me a burrito in 36 seconds. So if God doesn't answer my prayer in 36 seconds, God either doesn't love me God doesn't care or God is punishing me because God didn't answer my prayer right now. Isn't that how we pray? Isn't that how we feel? Anybody remember Daniel? Let me tell you a story about Daniel. Daniel, if you look at Daniel chapter 9, you might want to write that down because I'm going to read just a little bit in, in Daniel chapter 10. But Daniel chapter 9, Daniel began to pray for his people. And in this prayer, Daniel is asking God for an answer. He's asking God to answer his prayers, okay? There is a prayer that is going forth, just like what you and I do whenever we talk to God. Now, skip down to Daniel chapter 10, and I'm going to show you verse 12 and 13. There's an angel now that appears to Daniel. Daniel has been praying, but in this prayer, guess what? There's no answer. He doesn't see anything in the physical. Why? Because he cannot look into the spirit world. He can only see the physical. What, is the, what are we studying? Our battles are not against flesh and blood. Now we make it that. I've heard people say, my battle's with my husband because he's an idiot. My battle's with my wife because she's a dork. <laughs> I hear these comments all the time. We make it physical. But it's not. Your battle is not with your husband that you think is an idiot. Your battle is with an enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Your battle is with an enemy that does not want your marriage to ever succeed. What, you're, what, you, what the enemy wants is for it to be constant chaos in your home, constant fighting taking a place in your, in your life. He doesn't want you to trust each other, so he uses every situation Every tactic, he does whatever he can. Any demonic forces that need to be encompassed around that whole thing. There is a battle that has taken place for that marriage not to succeed. We make it physical, but it's not. We need to point a finger at the liar, at the thief, at the enemy, and take a stand and say, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Oh, no, you don't, devil. Because I'm not going to believe your lies anymore. I'm not going to do it. 
Daniel begins to pray. He's got a prayer that's going up. He's praying for his people. And now an angel shows up. And this angel talks to him in verse 12. And it's the first thing he says. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The enemy will always bring fear into your situation. The enemy will always bring fear and not understanding, turmoil, chaos into your mind. The enemy will always bring this into your situation. And the Word of God tells us this. We've talked about it. 365 different times in the Word of God, it says, Do not fear, fear not, do not be afraid. 365 times. If your mama tells you to clean the room up 365 times, that next time you're probably going to die. I'm just telling you. Because after 365 times, God's trying to get your attention. But you know what I love about that? I think he's telling us not to be afraid every day of the year. I've got this one for you. I've got this promise for you. I've got this promise for you. You don't have to be afraid. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So this angel shows up to Daniel. You've been praying. Angel shows up and says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He says, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding. (laughs) Don't you love what James says? James says, he who lacks wisdom, pray for it. And there is a God in heaven that will give you graciously what you need. He says, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Catch this. Your words were heard. You might want to write words, put a circle around it, and write prayers. Your prayers were heard. Your request was heard. The petition was heard. From the very first moment you gave it to God, from the very first moment you put your mind to the understanding that Jesus, you are in control. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't know why I'm going through it. But God, I give it to you anyway. From the moment He opened His mouth, From the moment he opened his mind, from the moment he handed it to God, the angel said, your words, your request, your prayer, it was heard. Don't you love our God? Don't you love him that his ear is not deaf to our cry and he understands when we hurt? How does he do that? How does he understand? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, skip down 14, and the Word put on flesh and dwelt among us. He went through every life situation that we go through, every hurt that we feel, every pain that we have. And if that wasn't enough, when they pinned him to a cruel cross on Calvary, he took every sin, every rejection, every pain, Can I go a little deeper? Every addiction, everything that holds us back, everything that causes us pain, every hindrance that holds us back, He took on every sin upon Himself. There is nobody that understands your pain, your hurt, your loneliness more than our Jesus because He experienced it all. He experienced it all. I love our God. That he didn't come to get us out of trouble. He came to get into trouble with us. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. Isn't isn't it amazing how it just just continues to to build upon itself? I'm not going to fear this evil. Why? Because he walks with me. Remember, he never called us to live in the shadows. But he called us to be exposed and to walk in the light. Because when the light comes on in our life, (laughs) the darkness has to flee. It goes away. So he says, from the very moment you humbled yourself before God, your words were heard. And the angel tells Daniel, he says, and I have come in response to them. Look at verse 13. I think this is interesting. But the prince 
of the Persian kingdom. What the Word of God is showing us here is that there is a demonic activity that is taking place. He is the prince of the Persian kingdom. He is a ruler in satanic activity that is probably in charge of a dominion of, of demons that are at his disposal to do his bidding and to do his work and to do his war. See, I believe that if we could peel back the blinders and be able to peer into the spirit world, we could look at the White House today and there is a demonic activity that is attacking the White House that our nation that was built in the name of God, that on our money it says, in God we trust, will not succeed but fall. And I believe we can't point a finger at physical people we have to point a finger at the evil that comes to kill steal and to destroy i believe there are demonic oppressions demonic forces demonic battles that is encamped in our marriages in our relationships they're over our schools they're around our churches there is a spiritual battle that is taking place but greater is he that is in me. I read the last chapter of the book and we win. You know? We win this thing. So let's just claim it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But the prince of the Persian kingdom, there was this demon, this demonic power, resisted me. God heard his prayer. God sent an angel God sent an answer, but in the process of trying to get to where Daniel was, spiritual warfare broke out, boom! And he found himself in the middle of a battle. He said, for 21 days, for 21 days, a spiritual battle took place. God sent the answer. But in the process, of, there is a demonic world that did not want the answer to get there. And for 21 days, Daniel did not see it with his physical eyes because he couldn't see into the spirit world. But for 21 days, there was a battle that was taking place to bring the answer to David. Sometimes we pray, and when we don't get the answer immediately, we think, God don't care, God don't love me, God gave up. But if we could look into the spirit world, we see there's so much more going on than what we can see. There is a battle taking place. And it says, for 21 days, then Michael, the archangel, it talks about in the Word of God, one of the chief, chief priests, princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Isn't it interesting that whenever we dive into the Word of God, the Word of God begins to reveal itself in a way that we can see what is taking place? See, that's, this is why we do what we do. So we understand not only our enemy, but we understand our king. But not only that, he wants us to understand our weapons. But how many of you know that, that in the battle, we get discouraged? Anybody but me? Hey, is anybody here a bigger baby than your pastor? Huh? Oh, good. <laughs> Next time I get down, we'll have a pity party, and we'll just pray that God just delivers us from that, okay? But, you know, I, I'm my almost worst enemy, and I don't know if you are, but I can speak the negative into my life more than anybody. Beat myself up. And in this battle, this is what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to turn us into something that we are not, and that's called identity theft. He wants to take your identity away from you. He wants to take us someplace that we didn't want to go. He wants to keep us someplace a whole lot longer than we ever wanted to stay. And he wants us to pay a price that is so much more than we ever wanted to pay. And that's called war. That's called war. Well, we're looking at this fraud protection. This fraud protection, let's throw it up on the screen real quick. I've got a graphic that I want to show you this fraud protection. And in this fraud protection, 
what God has given us is he's given us all the pieces of the armor. And real quick, as we wrap this up, we're going to look at the pieces of the armor and we're going to move very fast as we get into this. But the very first thing that he tells us that we need to put on is he says, put on the belt of truth. It is the absolute truth. It is the truth that you will know it is the truth that will set you free you will know the truth and that truth does what that is where freedom comes from that's where bondages are broke that's where the chains fall off it is in the freedom of jesus christ that we are resurrected we there's where salvation comes from and it is the truth it is the absolute truth of who jesus christ is and where do we put that truth it is girded around the middle post most part of who we are it is in the counterbalance of our life and if we don't have that truth of the, of the counterbalance of our life we will get knocked knocked off kilter very 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 easy yeah. but if you understand the armor they wore what was called tunics and a lot of times when they'd go into battle, what they'd do is they would take their tunic and they would begin to place it into the belt. They'd pick that tunic up and they would put all the pieces into that belt because if you ran into battle with your tunic just flying, it could snag on anything, anywhere, at any time and take you down and the enemy could get you. So what they would do is they would tuck everything up into the truth. What we've got to do is we've got to tuck everything that we've got into the truth of God's Word, into the truth of who he, is, who he is, into the absolute truth of how the Word of God describes who He is. Who is He? He is my salvation. That is the truth of my God. And so we, we put on that belt of truth and we put that thing around us. I love the story. There was a general that was going into battle. And sometimes when these generals long ago would go into battles, they would send in secret men at night that would do secret assassinations and kill off the heads of their leadership. And then they'd sneak back out. And then the next morning when battle took place, they'd go into the battle and they didn't have a leader. But this general had a better idea. He told his guys, he said, I want you to sneak in and instead of killing anybody, cut every one of the belts of the men that's, that are sleeping. Just cut their belts. The next morning, the trumpet blew. They came into the battle. The guys got up, ran out into the battle. Their pants fell down, and they couldn't fight. And they won their battle because they couldn't hold their pants up. The truth is what's going to keep us in a place that we can win the battle. The breastplate of righteousness covers what? It covers the vital organs. It is the breastplate of righteousness that we put on our salvation and we wear it as a shield over our heart. What the enemy wants to do is he wants to attack the issues of your heart because if he can get to your heart, if he can get to that hurt, if he can make you feel pain, that hurt will get to your head, that hurt head knowledge will get to your life and you will begin to live a defeated life put on that breastplate of righteousness i love how they say that whenever they would go into battle the romans knew how to make armor but they would build it in a in a sense that it looked like scales of a fish or of a snake and whenever they the sunlight would hit them in the midst of battle they would shine don't you love that they would shine and the enemy would look at them and think they're bigger than what they are it is what the light of god does in the salvation of our light whenever we are walking in the light and the love of jesus christ we are beaming with something and when we walk into the spirit's battle the demons go Whoo, <laughs> back up jack next thing says put on the gospel of peace those shoes of the gospel of peace see the romans knew when they went into battle that if they didn't have the right footing if they didn't have the right shoes on that they'd be in trouble so what they did was when they would they would scout out the terrain and depending on what they were fighting in they had spikes that could be anywhere from a half inch to two inches long that they could attach to their shoes so then whenever they went into battle with it was sand if it was rocks if it was mountains whatever it was the romans knew that if i can have a sure footing I can have a peace of mind that I can whoop my opponent. It is the shoes of peace. Think about that. It is the gospel of the word of God, of spreading the good news that gives us a sure foundation in this battle. Without the word of God, there's no peace. Without the word of God, there's no understanding. Without the word of God, we can get thrown off kilter so easy. But it gives us the sure footing that we need. It goes on to say, it says, and the shield of faith. What does the shield of faith 
do. It quenches all of the fiery darts of the enemy. This is one of my favorite to study because the shield that the Romans designed, they had a cute little shield that they would go into parades with. It was a cute little shield that was easy to carry and it was pretty and, and all this stuff. But whenever the Romans went into battle, they had a shield that was so big, the Greeks called it a door. They said their shield was as big as a door. It literally was a shield that covered the most part of their body that when they went into battle. This shield, a lot of times, was wrapped with, with leather soaked in water it had bronze rivets that were put into it and metal that was around it to hold it in place but they would soak it in water and also uh, the enemy would always come at them with fiery darts and they would set with these these wet leathered shields that looked like a size of a door going into battle and whenever they would begin to fire they would call for the for the shields to be up the army would stop, and as a whole, the front line would hold their shields and create a complete wall. The next would put a shield over the top of them. They would create a ceiling, and they literally could create a complete dome of protection underneath these shields. Isn't that cool? What was the shield for? To quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. It is that shield of faith. We've got to have faith. We've got to trust God. We've got to have an understanding that when we step out in this by faith, I know that's going to happen. I don't see the battle, but I believe the battle's taking place. I don't see the answer coming, but I believe my answer's on its way. Yeah. Next one is this, the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation covers our head. It covers your mind. It covers your thinking. Uh, Dr. Cho wrote a book called The Fourth Dimension. And in the fourth dimension, as he writes, he says at the very center of our brain is a spot that controls all of our body movement. It controls our arms, our fingers, our toes. Every electrical electro, uh, impulse that goes all the way through our body is centrally located in this one small part of the brain. But he said, guess what else is in that location with motor movement speech he said dr cho believes and it's been backed up by doctors now that we speak life or death into our bodies oh wait a minute didn't the bible tell us that we had to wait for a doctor to understand it yeah we put on that helmet of salvation it is the understanding of who i am as a child of god now guess what in the battle the enemy is going to tell you you're stupid so we look at the enemy and says oh but my god's bigger than you and he can take any of my stupidity and do anything he wants to with it and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world you don't worry about my stupidity huh the enemy is going to tell us things that you can't succeed, you can't do it, you cannot conquer. It is the helmet of our salvation that covers our minds. And it's in that salvation that you know who you are in Christ. It's the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the Word of God is living, it is powerful, and it is sharper than any two edged sword it cuts both ways it is the word of god that brings understanding into our life guys if you do not know how to pray you do not know what to pray for get in your prayer closet get in your war room pull out the word of god and begin to read the word of god and say enemy you have no attack over this because this is living this is powerful this is the word of god i will defeat you whenever jesus went into the wilderness and the enemy came at him in the wilderness and tempted him three times what did Jesus do? He didn't argue with him. He didn't zap him into a puddle, which he had all authority to do. But he fought him with the word of God each and every time. It is the sword of the Spirit. But he leaves us with this. But pray. How often 
do we use prayer as our last resource? How often do we go through a situation, just be honest with me, and it is so big, it is so great, and the hurt is so enormous that the last thing in the world we want to do is get on our knees before God and pray. Because we're tired, we're discouraged, we're wore out. David found himself where he wasn't supposed to be. And he fell into something. What the enemy wants to do is he wants you to take your burning your candle at both ends. He wants to take your tiredness. He wants to take your discouragement. He wants to take all of these things that we're fighting, that we're thinking, that we're feeling, and he wants to use them as a tool against us. Remember, how does the enemy defeat us? He defeats us with the tools that we hand him. I want to encourage you to do something this week, and, and I'm closing with this. This week, I don't want you to wait till you feel the battle. Okay? I'm going to ask you to do something, and if you're like Kayla Kirkendall, you're going to put visuals in your mind when I say this, so try not to. Just stick with me, okay? But in the morning, when you're naked and afraid in the shower, when it's just you alone with God, and you haven't even clothed yourself in the physical, but you are clothing yourself already in the spiritual, I want you to start to cry out to God before you ever step out the front door, before you ever step into the battle, before you ever step into anything. And I want you to cry out to God. And I want you to cry out to God with something unusual. Are you ready for this? I want you to start the battle this way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't think he gets enough of our praise. Can I take a side note and give some of you guys some marriage counseling? Are you ready? Guys, are you ready for this? Praising your wife will take you a whole lot longer further down the road than crucifying your wife. It's amazing what a kind word will do. It is amazing what a kind gesture will do. It is amazing that whenever I praise my wife for no reason, Life's happy, my life's happy. Isn't that it? It's amazing when I praise her for no reason how the atmosphere changes, how the temperature changes, how attitudes change, how love increases and how love grows, how we walk through a room and do goo goo eyes at each other. It's the little things. It's what I know when we put the little things in order. Big things naturally happen. They just naturally happen. How do I live this Christian life? How do I walk this walk? How do I get through this battle? Well, how do we eat an elephant? <laughs> One bite at a time. We celebrate every victory, no matter how small it may be. We celebrate every smile, every great attitude, every great thought that I have in the name of Jesus. We worship the one who was created to be worshiped for no reason other than you are God. Our prayer should be this, God, if you never did another thing for me ever again, your salvation would be enough. And I want to encourage you when you're standing in your shower naked, and maybe afraid of what is going to come. Turn your attention towards God and say, Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, I praise you. I'm not asking for anything. I'm not wanting anything. I'm just wanting you to receive my praise. Because we've got to have an understanding that I'm putting all the little things together and the big things are going to fall in place. Can I have a couple people agree with me on that? T, will you agree with me? Can you come right here down front? Can you come right here? You'll agree with me? We're going to stand in that. Ed, 
Can you agree with me? Come down here. Ah! Don't you even ah! Don't even think about it. I love this head. Cotton picker, I did it again. Will you agree with me? Yes. Mm. Alan, can you agree with me? Come on. Can you agree with me? We're just going to praise the Lord. We're going to rejoice. Angie, can you agree with me? Mm. We are just going, we're going to walk in this thing. Carrie, can you agree with me? Come on, Carrie, come agree with me. We're just going to praise Him. We're going to put the little things in order. Jenny, 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 can you agree with me in prayer? Can we trust God? Can we do it? All day long? We can do it. We can walk in His goodness. We can walk in His grace. We can walk in His understanding. This is how we do it. This is called unity. This is called family. This is called a cord that cannot be easily broken. This is the church that worships together. This is the church that seeks God together. This is the church that says, enemy, you have no authority in my life. This is the church that we cry together. This is the church that we praise together. This is the church that says, I will worship my God, for He alone is worthy of my praise. Can we agree? Come on, worship Him. We love You. Oh, we just love You. Sometimes there's no other words than just the attitude of gratitude and the praise that comes from my heart. Oh, let the praise constantly roll off my lips and let you hear it from me verbally that I love you. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I just know that you're going to give me the strength. I don't know what the battle is going to be or how hard it is going to seem, but all I know is you've already won the victory. I just know that that enemy that lies to me is a defeated foe. And that my God reigns victorious. And He reigns victorious over my life. I just love you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can y'all just keep telling me how much you love me for just a moment? Every head bowed, nobody looking around for just a moment. This has been an interesting series because this has been a series of bondage breaking, chains falling off, life's being restored in the name of Jesus and hope coming. But if you've walked in here today and there's an enemy that is in full out attack against your life, I've got everybody with their heads bowed, nobody's looking around. It's a very reverent place. It's me, you, and God, okay? But if you're here today and you are wounded, I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise, but you're wounded. You're hurt. You're destroyed. There's an enemy that's got a full out attack against you. And if you're in this place today and you're feeling that in your spirit and you know it in your head, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you. I see it, 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 I see it. Hands going up everywhere. Hey, if you raised your hand, I need, I need you to understand this. This is more than words. This is reality in your life. The bondage breaker is in the house. The healer has showed up. He is ready to move in your heart. He's ready to move in your life. He is about to set you free from something that has held you back, kept you down. There is a pain that's going to go away. It is going to disappear. Happiness is going to come. <laughs> Happiness is going to come. There is going to be a peace that passes all understanding. There is a new joy that's going to roll over in my song. And I may even begin to sing. <laughs> my wife loves it when I sing. That's you, you raised a hand. I'm going to pray for you, but don't let me pray for you. Pray with me as I pray over you. Jesus, here I am. Here I am in all of my pain, in all of my hurt, and in all of my want. First thing I want to tell you, Lord, is this. I don't understand, but I'm going to praise you. Father, I don't get it, but I'm going to praise you. 
I don't like the battle, but I'm going to praise you. It wasn't the results that I wanted, but I'm going to praise you. Today, what I want you to do is I want you to give him your hurt, your pain, your situation, your care. I want you to literally hand it to him. Maybe a physical thing where you're just handing it to him. God, take it because I can't handle it anymore. And today, in the name of Jesus, I pray for restoration. It's gone. It's gone. Let it go. Let go of it. It's gone. Pray for restoration in the name of Jesus. I pray for wholeness in the name of Jesus. Right standing in my heart and in my head in the name of Jesus. We're going to walk victorious in the name of Jesus. Enemy, you have to go. You're not welcome here any longer. You're not going to hold me down. You're not going to keep me under. You're not going to tie me up or wrap me up because my God has set me free. Tell him you love him. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hey, again, if you come in this place and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I do want to pray with you before you leave. I just want to invite him into your heart again. I'm not going to embarrass you call you out. I do want to talk to you after the service. But if that's you and you're here and you want to accept the Lord into your life, I want to pray with you. Our church wants to pray with you before you, you leave here today. And if you want to accept Jesus, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Just raise your hand real quick. And we'll just pray with you. Does everybody feel like we're good? Ah, oh, that's a good place to be. Do I see a hand? Amen. Amen. That's why, that's, this is why we do what we do, isn't it? Come on, church. Let's, let's help this individual pray. Can we do that? Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I realize I am lost without you. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And be the Lord of my life. And I want to live for you. Amen. Welcome home. Welcome home. Amen. You guys, I need a picture of this. God is good, isn't he? God is good. Hey, uh, next week, hey, don't leave this here, okay? Take this out of here. Let's walk in his understanding. Does anybody here just go, I get it. I didn't get it, but now I get it. Can anybody do this? I get it. I understand it. I love it. I love it. Take it home with you. Praise him in the morning. Okay? Praise him in and start the battle off right. Hey, come back next week for the table. It talks about the purpose, the plan, and the vision of the church. It's all laid out in the aspect of a table with all the chairs. Every chair that's at the table is for a specific purpose and a specific reason. If we don't understand the table, we're not going to understand our mission. So be here. These next four weeks will be enlightening and it will change your life as we dive into the Word of God. Can I pray a prayer of blessing over you? And then I'm going to send you home to the public, okay? Father, we love you. And Father, we thank you. <laughs> I just want to thank you because you're incredible. I just want to thank you because what I find in you is real. And not just real, but it is everlasting. I want to thank you for the little things like joy, peace, understanding, and I want to pray that as you have enlightened us with the Word of God today, that as we leave this place today, put a smile on our face and put a skip in our step. And we're going to be careful always to give you all the praise and the glory. As all of God's people said, Amen.